welcome to Warwick iCast. In this week's programme we're focusing on how the university is raising its international profile. The Warwick Commission is a new body which has been given the task of discussing one of the most pressing problems facing the world today, trade. Since 2001, the Doha Round, a series of meetings aimed at establishing a sustainable worldwide trade agreement, is faltering, as the developed and developing worlds cannot agree a way forward. The Commission is bringing together experts from all sides to see if they can provide a framework to resolve some of the most difficult issues. It's been established by the University of Warwick's Vice-Chancellor, Professor Nigel Thrift. And I think that is most important is to have more universities looking seriously at pressing global problems. And that's what the Warwick Commission has been set up to do. Uh, and it will be doing it on an annual basis, starting, of course, with this particular commission on world trade. I think it's a very good um, uh, initiative to look at one of the most pressing problems that we currently have in global economic governance and to bring together a high-profile group of uh, people from all over the world. I think this is appropriate and fits uh, Warwick's profile. The idea is to look at the contemporary world trade regime through fresh eyes. We call it a next generation commission, uh, by which we mean that we've got some young scholars and practitioners on it, uh, as well as some old and, and senior and established scholars. Uh, our assumption is that there's a bit of an impasse in the world trade system at the moment, and one of the things the commission wants to do is think about life beyond the completion of the Doha round of, of trade negotiations to ask basically what other things are happening, what other things can be done, how can the WTO uh, be made more effective in a wider context. We deliberately decided to bring in a new generation of WTO thinkers. So it would be nice to see this new generation cooperating for the first time, setting up a bit the turf on which they all are, and uh, beginning to identify our working method, you know, of uh, the sort of interviews we want to conduct. Warwick is an international research university and that's crucial to its existence. So one of the things we're also trying to do with the Commission is also feedback into Warwick's image as a really a global player. The first Warwick Commission is unique in bringing together accomplished scholars, economists, lawyers and policy makers to come to joint conclusions. They will be looking at the future of multilateral trading systems, whether economic institutions are helping or hindering third world countries, and what role the World Trade Organization will play in the future. All hugely important issues and something of a challenge for those involved. The trade system's got much more complex. World trade now has a series of major actors in it, other than simply North America and Western Europe. The developing world is much more disaggregated than it was. When we talk of the developing world, we're not talking about a range of states that are all the same. China and India are clearly becoming major players. You actually have to cater to the interests of a much wider range of actors, not only the big players, but also the smaller players. There is also an important issue of justice uh, for the poorer countries. Agriculture remains a major problem. Even though it's not a significant element of world trade, it's politically very important. And it's an area that affects the smallest and the weakest states uh, more than any others. And bringing resolution to these kinds of problems in a, a just and fair way is difficult. Uh, and it's a matter of politics, not just of economics. Bilateralism and regionalism more generally has exploded exponentially in the last decade or two. And it does raise the question of what the role of the multilateral trading system, the non so-called non-discriminatory basis of the multilateral trading system is obviously challenged by regional and bilateral agreements. But these regional and bilateral agreements exist for a reason. Governments have seen it in their interests to strike these agreements. I think our job as the, as the, as the if you like, the core focal point of international trade relations among almost all nations is to, is to play for coherence, to try to ensure as much coherence as possible in these different arrangements. It's the unbalance between the memberships, uh, imbalance between the level of development of the different members that create vast difficulties. 
also the fact that we've made a lot of compromises and we've made a lot of adaptations. Um, the countries that are already developed benefit of a certain wealth that help us compose with the disparities that trade agreements bring. And the South they don't have that in the developing countries. We have to find new ways to accompany the WTO progress. What I mean is that I do believe that we will continue to make progress in whatever we negotiate at the WTO. But we have to find ways of redistributing the benefits of the economic benefits better between nations, but within nations as well. For many years, the WTO was dominated by a small number of powerful states, the Quad countries. Um, since 2000, that's begun to change. Um, I think that developing countries have uh, obtained a voice. Um, the open question is whether they have obtained influence. And I think that a central challenge moving forward is to find a way to structure a process so that all states, not just the powerful states, can be heard. Trying to achieve a balance between multilateralism and bilateralism and still retain a sense of world order will be a key discussion point for the members, especially as it is the search for equal status amongst the developed and developing world that's caused controversy over the last few years. The Doha round is trying to come to grips with the endemic problem of international trade, which is uh, farm subsidies in the West. Agriculture has always been either a deal maker or a deal breaker. It's a very contentious issue because you are trying to reform the agriculture system in Europe and America and Japan, Korea, uh, Norway, etc. These are the kind of countries who are interested in keeping high tariffs, give high subsidies to their farmers to be able to produce at a low cost and sell around the world, which has in turn had the sort of deleterious consequence of the developing world farms not being able to produce and be able to compete effectively in the global market, uh, including their own domestic markets. It's difficult to put a very clear meaning on the notion of equity in trade relations other than that. We create a level playing field in which there is equality of opportunity in some sense. I think that's what the system seeks to do. Of course, there are many things that can legitimately criti be criticised about the system in relation to whether or not the rules are fair. But over time, I think there's an, an evolutionary process by which the rules do become more balanced in the direction of serving the interests of a growing number of countries that have real stakes in, in international trade. I believe that the WTO is really is in a crisis. The multilateral system, trade system is in a crisis. And yet many of us hope that we do not go into protectionism. I think protectionism will not benefit. The losers of protectionism will be developing countries. Also developed countries, but particularly developed countries. So it is still multilateralism in a positive sense has to be seen as a global public good. But in the end, our solution, um, proposals we come up with, the WTO has to be open and to say some changes need to happen. If you talk to um, senior trade officials and more importantly politicians in, in, in any of the countries that are major players in the system, they will all say to a person, yes we know multilateralism is the first best option and yes we know how important it is, and, but they spend much more time and energy uh, looking for the next bilateral to negotiate. And, and I think that if that problem can be addressed, and that perhaps is the most intractable of the problems, then the system may be, um, may be well down the path for um, reinventing its importance and its relevance and its legitimacy. One advantage the Commission has is the mix of people around the table. They're considered to be part of a new generation of thinkers who have a fresh view of the pros and cons of multilateral trade systems and so approach the task of providing viable answers with enthusiasm and optimism. It was absolutely crucial to get uh, a mixed makeup of people. Uh, we have some of the best academics in the area working with some of the best policy makers in the area and the result of that is we're having a genuinely informed discussion. It's one that's neither too abstract 
nor too applied, but is absolutely right at the best place to actually talk seriously about what the issues are and just as seriously about one, what one might do about them. What's exciting about this commission is uh, I think they have uh, they've collected really the best of young thinkers from economics, from political science, from law, who will really take a fresh look um, at the WTO in this time of very strong transition. The system is in stasis. The system has run out of gas. It needs a push. I don't think the push is going to come from inside. It's going to come from outside. Hopefully we can contribute to that. I have high hopes for a report that will be creative, forward-looking, helpful, pragmatic, and able to resolve some of the tough issues that we've been encountering. Over the next few months, the Warwick Commission will hold further sessions in London, Brussels and New York before reporting its findings in Geneva in December. This first Warwick Commission will no doubt raise the profile of the university and its ability to contribute to the international debate by providing this unique forum.